I guess the U.S. men seem to have a lot of lack of quadruple jumps and a lack of, you know, triple axles often. Is this something where you think that maybe in the old system for a long time that the quad, like your quads weren't maybe valued as much as they should have been at nationals or someone who could do a quad? I guess, you know, why is the U.S. really starting to lag behind technically all of a sudden? Well, I think it became, I, I think it was partly a product of the code of points because it was so punitive. If you if you fell in a quad and God forbid it was a little bit short, I mean it was basically like mm -hmm. not only are you losing you get no points for it, but then you're also gonna get ding you you know, you get the minus one for the fall and your components get dinged. And it's so like across the board it was like if you didn't know a hundred percent you could go and land it, it was a suicide mission. And, you know, a lot of people fell victim to that because it's like, oh, I should try the quad. Yeah, I'm landing it in practice. But then they would get out for nationals and be like, you know what, it's not worth it because you go from potentially winning to being six. There's really nothing you can do. So I think it's partly a product of the IJS itself, but I think it was, I think it was exacerbated by USFS. I don't think that, you know, I think that too much of the other stuff was dinged when people did miss. And you know what, it's, you knew at some point one of the international kids was going to start doing them because, you know, in those countries, at nationals, they have nothing to lose. Like, the guy from Spain goes out, like, he's going, like, he's clearly the best one in the country. So he's going, like, even if he falls on a quad or falls on two quads, he's going to win. So it's worth it in that sense for him to take the risk because at least within his own country, there's nothing to lose. Here it's a little different, but I don't think that the emphasis was pushed, put on the right things, both by the judging establishment and in most cases by the coaches. It was like, then, play it safe, do a clean program, whatever. But in the long run, we're, it just doesn't work. So do you think that maybe selecting you know, the world team for this year when we're you know, picking, you know, trying to get spots for the Olympics next year, do you think that maybe they should go towards a more selection-based procedure when there are two spots. That way, some of the they, people can feel comfortable, you know, putting the more difficult jumps at at nationals, and you kind of take whoever has been the best along the season if maybe they're third at nationals, but they, had, they did better at the Grand Prix than someone. I guess, do you think it should be more like gymnastics where there is a selection, or do you think we should just, whoever puts it down at nationals, we send them? There is actually a selection. I don't really remember the exact details of it, but we, we actually voted on the selection not. process where it doesn't, it's not 100% based on nationals, but I think in the past nationals has been too heavily weighted because in a lot of cases, the results at nationals, I don't always feel reflect what people actually did at that nationals. So I don't necessarily think even if everyone goes and skates well, I don't think nationals is really a clean slate. Like, there's always some weird political stuff behind the scenes. Like, the now, a lot of people don't always win when they should. It's maybe a year late. It's maybe a year early. But I, it doesn't necessarily line up to what's done that day. Is that something that, as a skater, you know going in? Because in 2000... You skated so well, but it really seemed like it was Michael Weiss's year. And then in 2001, it, it seemed like it was your year. It was your time. So as you talk about nationals, is that something that there were certain years when you knew going in that this was your moment beforehand? I didn't actually feel that way going into Boston. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't. I was injured and I had been off the ice and I wasn't particularly skating that well at the time but there's I don't necessarily I never necessarily felt like I was going in as the favorite but I think as competitors and I don't know Jen you probably have felt this yourself but like you also know going in when you like like you know that it's no matter how well you skate you're not going to win yes I know that very where, well. Where it's like, I mean, you basically, the, you know, the people that have been deemed better than you basically would have to go out and do a free dance to not win. And so I, I don't know if it's quite the same now with IJS because, you know, you have to add the points up from somewhere. But I think there is a sense of like, you know, certain people are going to get some, 
generous component scores to kind of make it all work out the way sort of the inner workings of the Federation want it to work out. And I think that's always been the case. And I don't think that people are always necessarily fooled, especially the audience. I think that's so right. And I think when we talk about this, you think of the role that the buzz surrounding a skater plays and kind of that momentum going into the the competition, whether it's the early season. I was also wondering what you thought about the role that commentators play. Did you listen to your events back after after you skated, and did you pay attention to the press surrounding you, whether it was positive or negative, or were you someone who tried to shield yourself from that buzz? I definitely... I never listened to the commentary when I was watching. Like, when I would watch... Um, my competition programs after a competition, I would watch, like, either, you know, like, on the internet or whatever, like, not necessarily with the commentators. Um, I think, honestly, most of the commentators over the course of our careers, Jen, mm -hmm. um, were extremely biased, and I think they did a lot of damage to people's careers, quite frankly. Um, it makes me think of the refrigerator break comment. Yes, I thought that was I mean, so uncalled for. So, so unprofessional, um, it... Honestly, I I think for the most of our for most of our careers, they sat in a bully pulp bully pulpit. They trashed people that didn't. Their commentary didn't even necessarily reflect what people were doing at that time. Um, I, I personally, I didn't feel there was very little. There was very much journalistic integrity. Um, they really they had their favorites. It was very obvious, and then everyone else just got shredded. Um, I, think it's I definitely important. thought it was less so at the Olympics, but it was also a different group of commentators. Do you think it's important to kind of court the commentators? Because one thing that you'll notice is that Scott Hamilton's often maybe high on someone when they're represented by IMG, and if they're supposed to do well or in the hunt for medal, it seems like he loves them. You know, he'll be like, oh, he's such a great guy, such a great person for the sport, to know her is to love her. And then they're touring with Stars on Ice a couple weeks later, whereas, you know, and you've heard Dick Button talk about, you know, a gift that Michelle Kwan gave him at Nationals, or certain skaters have said that certain skaters might have, gone out to lunch with some of the commentators. So do you think that if you're trying to establish a career, it's really important to politic those judges and those commentators to kind of get everyone on uh, absolutely, your side? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, in a lot of times the commentators even influence the judges to some extent. So they, you know, perception becomes reality at that point. Um, but it's a, t you know, it's a tough, sort of line to walk between like you know being cordial and building those bridges and then just there becomes a point where the relationship is too close and then it can't really be professional anymore mm -hmm. um i think that's much less true with the print media uh like there's a bunch of reporters over the years that like wrote very favorable things, and w when I did well, and, you know, when I didn't do well, called it, called it like it was, but, like, I would still be able to go and, like, you know, have a cup of coffee with them backstage at Nationals or at Worlds or whatever, and it's fine, like, they're doing their job, mm -hmm. but I think there's also something, there's a little bit more at stake when it's written down, because you can go to someone and highlight a line and be like, that's not accurate, or that's, you know, a little... It's something. Whereas on TV, it's like, what are you going to do? Run around with one of those little <laughs> microphone things and be like, okay, like that Proof. was, yeah, like you're going to play it back from it and be like, okay, you're rude. I mean, you can't really. Yeah, it seems like it's so more subjective too, in a way, 